What is up, skeptics? Thomas Westbrook here. This last week, I had the tremendous honor of getting to sit down with Hemant Mehta for an interview. Now, if you're not familiar with who Hemant Mehta is, then you haven't been active in the atheist movement for long, because Hemant is a cornerstone of the atheist movement. I remember years ago when I was a creationist stumbling across his work and being drawn in by his friendly, non-hostile approach, which really helped to tear down a lot of the narratives that had been built up by the church that I had against atheism. And when I saw it portrayed in a non-negative light, then I was able to approach these issues from a logical, reasonable, rational perspective rather than an emotional one. Fast forward a few years and Hemant was one of the first people to blog out one of my videos, giving it enough velocity to gain virality and to give me a significant subscriber boost to continue to do this full time. Now if that isn't enough reason to like Hemant, then you have to appreciate the sheer amount of diligence and hard work that he puts into his blog. Especially in this day and age when so many people are turning away from the mainstream media to the first blogger or vlogger that they agree with, who's oftentimes blasting out the first story that fits their narrative from their mother's basement. It's refreshing to find someone who has enough journalistic integrity to not only check their sources, but to oftentimes go straight to the source themselves to confirm the validity of a story. Without further ado, I give you Hemant Mehta, The Friendly Atheist. Hey Hemant, how are you? I'm good, Thomas. How are you? Fantastic. I'm really excited to be able to talk with you. Um, I've been following your work for some time now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, You've been a part of the movement for much longer than I have. How, how long would you say that, two uh, questions, how long would you say you've been an atheist? Yeah. And how long would you say that you've been an activist? So I'm 34 now. I think I've been an atheist since I was about 14. And I probably started getting active in college when I had an opportunity to start a group. And that was, what, like 18 or not, probably 19. Um, so I, I've been doing stuff within the movement, whether it's working with nonprofit groups um, quietly on the sideline, you know what I mean, or um, actually taking a vested interest in kind of how atheism is talked about and promoted and advocated for. So, um, and the website started maybe like 10 years ago-ish. So um, it's been different kinds of involvement over time, definitely more involvement over time. Um, but yeah, it feels weird because it's been going on for like most of my life, almost, uh, in some capacity or another, I've been like thinking about atheism. Now, 10 years ago, was that your happiness at the time? No, it wasn't. Uh, 10 years ago, I was not blogging, um, but I had uh, done this weird experiment where I go, uh, go to a whole bunch of churches, Christian churches, as an atheist, and I had a chance to write a book about it called I Sold My Soul on eBay. And it was kind of, I mean, it was weird because that's a cool opportunity when you've never written stuff before. And after I was done with that, I was like, oh, I kind of like this idea because I did a little blogging, right, as the book uh, was starting. And I'm like, I kind of like this idea of writing some thoughts and getting this immediate feedback. Thankfully, the comments weren't horrible. And it's like, OK, I don't that was kind of neat. I wish I could do that more, even though this book is done. And so the the website just started on its own when that kind of happened and uh, you can you can go through my old archives through the current website friendlyatheist.com you can look at what i wrote in like 2006 or 7 and like it's cringeworthy it's all really bad it's not good <laughs> blogging it's not good writing it's just crap um but it was kind of neat that oh you can well, talk and, about and this your, stuff your perspective probably has shifted oh too, my god so. yeah 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 absolutely i mean there's no way i would call it friendly atheist now <laughs> i don't think of that friendly now <laughs> But uh, it is interesting to kind of see that shift, and and hopefully I've become better at what I'm doing, but uh, that's kind of how it got started. The Pathios thing happened maybe four or five years ago um, when they said, come on over to our platform and do it there, and uh, they've been great to work with ever since. Yeah, I was, I was wondering, you said that you you kind of made a, a bit of a transition. I, I still, when I look at your content and when I watch your videos, um, I'm generally I'm like, okay, he comes across as, as very friendly. Good. But you you say you wouldn't identify. Yeah, as I mean, that. I don't think I would identify as that because there's always someone who is. If I'm critical of religion, and I think there's plenty of reason to be critical of religion, 
Uh, someone's always going to say, I thought you were friendly. Why would you say something like that? It's like, well, being friendly doesn't mean you just let this stuff go. There are legitimate things to be angry about. And I, I have much less patience, I think, today for uh, religious believers of any stripe. Um, that's not to say I, I treat them like dicks or something, but that, oh, like, oh, you believe uh, other silly things like... I don't know. Part of me just wants to like fight about it. I want to debate about it now. Um, and I don't think I would have cared so much if someone was a quote unquote harmless believer, you know, 10 years ago. It's like, oh, you're not going after gay rights? Then, okay, be religious. I mean, what harm does that do? And it's like, you know what? You don't have to be a- an extremist or, you know, super conservative in your religious beliefs to know that even the harmless religions have a lot of power, and it's negative. I mean, uh, even religions like Mormonism, which gets a, a relatively positive reputation. I mean, you know, Mormon people are generally nice, amiable people, but Mormon beliefs are really pernicious, and the things they do to people who leave the faith, uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses especially, too. If you leave or you try to leave, I mean, they make your life a living hell. So, I don't know. I knowing more of that stuff now than I did before. I think well, I'm just well, not just Jehovah's Witnesses and, and Mormons either. You know, um, I grew up in a Muslim country. Oh my God! And, and yeah, um, there is not so much in the country that I was in, just because it, it was one of the more secular ones. Yeah. But uh, you know, I've, I've been to Afghanistan. I've been to other places where if you are an apostate, you fear for your life. Of course, and and knowing and, that some people have. Uh, escaped that and hearing their stories is incredible and hearing uh, you know even critics of religion uh, who get slaughtered in Pakistan in India that we're seeing um, so yeah I mean uh, Islam the is bloggers in Bangladesh. yes that, that's what I was getting at to the bloggers in Bangladesh I mean the, the fact that that happens obviously Islam is like an extreme example of this stuff but that's what I'm getting at I, I think a lot of people know that you know Islam taken at that extreme is is horrible. I don't think uh, a lot of people know about how bad it is for people who leave other religions because, yeah, they're not going to kill you, but they'll make your life like an emotional wreck. Um, And I certainly didn't know that for a long time. Did did any of that happen to you as you were walking away from your faith? No. With your your family? I've been super lucky that uh, I, I grew up in the Jain religion, J-A-I-N. It is mostly a nonviolent, that's kind of their biggest tenet. Don't be violent in your words, in your actions, in, you know, we're vegetarian, things like that. Uh, that's all well and good. Um, I don't believe in the karma, reincarnation, heaven, hell, that nonsense. Um, but well, there, when, there's, no, there's no doctrine of hell within Jainism, right? There, so this is weird is because what I found out since I left Jainism is that the beliefs that I grew up being taught, whether it's by my parents or through the temple, they're not necessarily the ones you would find on paper. So there are things I thought, oh, this is what Jains believe. And if I look at it now from like an academic, like, oh, this is what a scholar says Jains believe. It's not exactly what I was taught. So I honestly, I don't even know what's legit. And I know I grew up being taught uh, that there is a heaven and a hell, though it's not the Christian perception of it per se. But the point is, when I left Jainism and when I finally told my parents that I didn't believe this stuff, uh, they weren't happy about it. They're still not happy about it. I mean, believe me, they don't go around saying our our son's like an atheist. Um, But... We get along fine. We just try to avoid the topic of religion. It's like they care about other stuff, you know? So they don't fear for your soul. Uh, If they, no, they don't fear for my soul. And and honestly, they don't really bring it up at all. So I I don't have to deal with that. The funny thing is we've gone to, you know, uh, weddings of relatives and, and other gatherings like that. And my parents will actually come up to me. They're like, have you talked to this uncle or this auntie? Because they're an atheist too it's like you'll get along go chat with them it's like all right (laughs) so i mean it's one of those weird things where they don't really understand it they don't get where i'm coming from they don't really want to have a conversation to try to understand it and and that's fine um but thankfully no they're they're, they never cut me out of my life or me out of their lives or anything that i've i've heard from other people so we we get along great well that's one thing i've found probably the most painful in my life has been um, 
not so much that I've had a lot of family members that have been so confrontational and, you know, like, yeah, I, I have had, you know, family members tell me that, you know, I'm going to hell if I don't repent and stuff like that. But for right. the most part, I, I've been surprised at the level of apathy. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the best you can hope for, right? Like they're not going to embrace well, it, but if you don't I, care, it's like, eh, all right. I don't know. I, I would say that, um, it's somewhat maddening because if they were at least a little bit interested, at least a little <laughs> bit confrontational, I could have that dialogue. Yeah, that's true. And I true. could have that conversation and I could explain why, like, I'm not an angry atheist. I right. don't want to just, like, is that destroy a con- everything that they believe in. Is that a conversation that, you want to have with your family, that debate about why you believe what you believe? Because I don't know that so I want to have that conversation. Not so much in a debate format. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, you're familiar with street epistemology and, yeah. and kind of the more friendly approach. And um, The let's discuss uh, why I, we believe these things and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, you know, even just being able to have that dialogue of how can we know something is true? Let's right. re-examine our beliefs. And I'm open to admitting that I don't know everything and I could very well be wrong. Right, right. But I, I, I would appreciate the same level of um, intellectual honesty and you know, lack of hypocrisy for it, them to do the same. It's funny. I'm more comfortable having that conversation with complete strangers than with my own family. I, it's just not something I care to talk about with them. But it's interesting now because I have a baby uh, and the baby's kind of getting to the point where she's starting to talk and she's she's able to be a human, basically, you know. Um, and so there's going to be and, and my whenever I bring her to my parents house, one I mean, when they're talking to her, playing with her, one of the things that are teaching her are the prayers that they taught me growing up. And you know what? It's one of those like, look, if you're going to watch the baby and I don't have to watch the baby for a little while, you can do whatever the hell you want. I'm not going to argue with you. But I wonder when that's going to come to a, if that's going to come to a point where we have to like step in and say, this is too far. I don't know what that point is. But uh, do, you, do you think it has to? Uh, like, I'm sure you know, you've heard the, the phrase, uh, teach a child one religion, you indoctrinate them, teach right. them all religions, you inoculate them. Right. I mean, do you think just, just by kind of exposing your kids to, to every religion that's out there and showing them why? You know, they can't all be right in high school. Right. Um, you, know. you know, I don't know. I'm not worried right now. Otherwise, I would have said something to this point. So, I mean, clearly, I had plenty of indoctrination, quote unquote, and it didn't work on me. And the, the baby has much less of it because it's only my grandparents. It's not me. It's not the wife. It's not her family. <laughs> so it's like she's being exposed to different ideas already. So I'm not worried right now, but I just wonder, like, when she gets old enough to ask questions about this stuff, I wonder what those questions will be. Because at some point she's got to realize, oh, grandma teaches me this and this and this, but, you know, mommy and daddy don't believe any of this stuff. So what's up with that? Um, That'll be an interesting conversation when the time comes. It's a good exercise in uh, free thought. It is. And you know what? To me, it's a lot like Santa Claus too. And I've heard this before from many people, but it's like, I don't mind telling the uh, baby about Santa Claus if you know now that she's getting to that point because I know those training wheels are going to come off at some point so it's not a worry but you never know with religion if they're ever going to come to that conclusion that oh this is a myth too um so it, it's slightly different but uh you're right I mean exposing them to different ideas is probably the best inoculation to indoctrination so more power mm. Now, you met, um, you've been involved in the movement for some time. You met Christopher Hitchens about five years before he passed away. I've met him a couple Um, of times. I don't know if he knows who the hell I am or anything like that. But yeah, at a couple of conferences, I've seen the guy, had very brief conversations with the guy. Yeah. Well, when when interacting with people like that, did that kind of change your, your outlook a little bit on... Um, organized religion. You know what? I It was interesting. Uh, Hitchens didn't because I was already an atheist before he even wrote uh, God is Not Great. Um, and any interaction I had with the would, guy only happened. Would you that. classify yourself as an anti-theist? I don't know. At times, yes. Um, I mean, there are clearly religions where uh, most of the believers are really good people. 
and they're motivated by their faith to do good things. I think they're doing the good things for the wrong reasons, but they're doing good things. So I, I wouldn't go so far as to say, oh, if you have any religious beliefs, like that's a bad thing. Um, so I don't know that I would go that far. Uh, believe, I mean, look, even if you took religion out of the picture, there are plenty of things people believe that I think are really dumb. Um, but it's not the end of the world. I mean, everyone believes some stupid stuff. I don't know that religion's any worse in some cases than anything else. So I don't know if I, I never use the word anti-theist to describe mm-hmm. myself, but certainly I think religion is a lot of times really bad. Now, this might be a little bit close to home, but yeah. would you possibly consider yourself anti-theist towards uh, Jainism? Less so, I think, actually. Less and maybe so. that's because I know it a little better, but I don't know. I've, I've Obviously, by definition, because Jains are like non-religious, you're not going to see Jains do some crazy shit like a terrorist attack or anything. Whoa. But they yeah. also believe in things like fasting to... Uh, achieve some spiritual goals and sometimes they take that too far where I mean I I've written about this before but you know my sister was one of the people who fasted for like eight days straight to uh, make the people at the temple happy with only water being the only thing she she took in that's horrible if you're a growing child I mean so even some of the Jane beliefs can go way too far but um for, by and large, I haven't met that many Jain people who, because of their Jainism, do things that I find really horrible. Well, that's one thing that, that Sam Harris touches on is that, you know, when he's talking about Islam and, and other dangerous ideologies, is that um, whenever you talk about an Islamic fundamentalist, the problems aren't that they're fundamentalists, it's with the fundamentals of Oh, Islam. Islam, right, right. Because he, he draws the, the parallel to Jainism where the most extreme Jains will <laughs> sleep with a cloth over their mouth so yeah. they don't swallow a bug. Yeah, it's interesting because I've, I, I remember Sam Harris wrote about that one uh, in The End of Faith, too, which is interesting because I'd never heard anyone talk about Jainism, uh, period, and much less in a book where he's, that he's criticizing religion left and right, and somehow he has praise for Jainism. Really yeah. interesting. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, but wait, Jains also believe in a lot of crazy things, uh, like the supernatural stuff and reincarnation, and they do that fasting thing, which can be cr- like insane, depending on how serious you take that. Um, so just because it preaches nonviolence doesn't mean it's exempt from this idea that the fundamentals of Jainism uh, might be wrong. There are things that are problematic about the religion. They believe some stuff that has no basis in science whatsoever, uh, or evidence or reason. It's just not, Janes aren't the sort of people that are going to like fight the school board against science class or anything like that. So it's not harmful like conservative Christianity or Islam in a certain country or what have you, um, but it's not blameless. Well, that, that reminds me of, there is a quote at least attributed to the Dalai Lama where he said, you know, if science proves Buddhism wrong, then Buddhism will have to change. Is yeah. Jainism similar to that? it's interesting. I think I probably left Jainism before I could have conversations like that. So, you know, uh, topics that started to come up after I had left Jainism, uh, things like, you know, the uh, ethics of abortion. Is that uh, good or bad in the view of Jainism? Things uh, like homosexuality. Uh, They never came up because I was never old enough to really understand those topics when I was still a Jain. So uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because uh, I don't know what Jains believe about those things. Those aren't conversations I typically uh, have anymore. And it's not something, like I said, I ever raised with my parents. So There's a quote in um, your book, uh, Sold My Soul on eBay, um, where you said, if I couldn't get answers, and by answers I meant the same reliable, reasonable <laughs> answers from different Jane scholars to all my questions, did that mean that no one knew the answers? And yeah. if they didn't know the answers, then how could they claim that Jainism is right? Yeah, I'd stand Dude. by that. Yeah. Um, and it's funny um, because you see it especially within Christianity in, in the U.S. where you talk to 100 Christians about any controversial topic, you're going to get 100 different answers. And even the most prominent voices in Christianity, whether it's conservative or progressive Christianity, um, they will interpret passages very different ways. So you're not going to get the same answer from them either. And 
if the question is, well, what is true Christianity or what is true Jainism, uh, maybe it's an unfair question because there isn't one. It's whatever people make of it. And plenty of people say that about Islam, too. Like, this is the criticism people have of Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, what have you, which is that when they say the fundamentals of Islam are the problem, what are the fundamentals of Islam? Because if you ask different uh, Muslim scholars, you're going to get different answers. It's not necessarily, oh, the stuff that the interpretation ISIS uses, that's what Islam truly is. No, it's not. That's according to ISIS. Like, if you ask other imams, they're going to tell you, no, it really is a religion of peace, and here's how we interpret these aspects of it. Um, so, I mean, it's it's silly to think that there's only one right way to interpret these passages when everyone interprets everything all sorts of different ways. Well, the, the dangerous thing about it is, though, well, you know, on the one hand, you know, you have, what, some somewhere around 80% of Muslims are Sunni, and, and then you've got the, the Shias, mm-hmm. and you have the you know, strict Quranists and stuff, or Quranists, uh, my yeah. pronunciation is probably horrible, but um, my Arabic's awful too. But <laughs> um, when, whenever I hear that, what, what I find so dangerous about it is, you know, people who say that Islam isn't a violent religion and people who say that it is, they're both right. Mm-hmm. Because you can take the same passages and you can interpret them in two different ways. And right, can, and even when they're written know. very specifically, like, uh, whatever, kill the apostate, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. <laughs> Whenever it says that stuff, there are ways, I mean, in Christianity, it says some horrible things too, but they have ways of saying, here's why you shouldn't take that at face value. Um, and Islam has or, that... Or even which, which hadith they're going to adhere to. Right, right, right. So, so, again, uh, I think... That when you say, not you, when, you know, Hitchens or Harris says, you know, these are the fundamentals of Islam, I, I, there are way too many Muslims who would, who would hear that and say, you don't know what the fundamentals of Islam are because um, they're different. I mean, plenty of Muslims do not believe that stuff. Certainly in the U.S. they don't believe that stuff. Um, so I don't know. But at it's, the same time, it's, yeah. it's a little bit dishonest to, you know, for them to argue that, you know, ISIS that they're not true followers of the Quran. Because I mean, they're ISIS can quote. Trying to, they're doing everything that they can to follow it to the letter. To the letter, right. And, so and, the question that's, is... That's what, makes, that's what makes the ideology so dangerous. Right. I mean, I, I don't disagree. Taken in that way. I don't disagree with you here. I mean, they can easily point to chapter and verse and say, look, this is what we're following. This is where we're coming from. And I guess what I'm getting at is... Plenty of religious scholars could say, yes, it really does say that in the Quran, or it says horrible things in the Old Testament or whatever, but you're missing the context for that thing, and here's what the context is, and here's why uh, you're not actually supposed to do that stuff. So, I mean, Christians have a way of saying, you know, all that horrible stuff about let's stone gay people in Leviticus or kill them. Um, Here's why that doesn't matter, or you shouldn't take that. Yes, it says it in the book. Um, but it doesn't mean you're doing Christianity right if you follow that literally. Um, I just wish that side of the story would get, or that perspective would get a bigger voice within Islam in certain countries. It doesn't, yeah. because when you mix that interpretation with a, a certain type of culture, a certain type of politics, I mean, it's not a good combination. Um, yeah. But again, this is one of those things where religions. Are, you could take religion because it's reliant on faith and certain interpretations, um, and you give someone with a powerful, confident voice who's spreading the message. I mean, you can get people to believe whatever the hell you want to believe. I mean, this is the problem with religion as a whole. And yes, right now, Islam is worse than pretty much every other religion when it comes to these issues. But you know what? It, give it a few hundred years or whatever, And I'm sure another religion will be bad for the same type of reason, because when you're basing your beliefs not on facts, not on evidence, but on faith, on interpretations of things written way back when, you're bound to see these sorts of things happen, where people will say, I'm using this religious ideology to achieve my goals, because, I mean, that's a powerful thing. People can't argue against your religious beliefs, you know what I mean? So they're going to listen, and it's it's... It's very tough for people. No wonder religious terrorist people can like find recruits. It's easy to say, look, we have this interpretation of the holy book. So if you want to be a good Muslim, here's what you have to do. Um, 
it's hard to argue with something like that sometimes. Especially when the book says it's the final revelation. That yeah, it's the perfect yeah. Word of God. <laughs> right, right. You know, and then then for them to to come into a, a war torn area where you have thousands of youth and you have thousands of people fleeing to Europe who are being treated terribly. Right. When you know, not not all of them. Obviously, some are, are accepted, but just you know, the the amount of blowback and the lack of you know, openness and assimilation. I'm not saying that there should be open borders across the board, but what I am saying is once someone is there, if you treat them like trash, yeah, you you know, there, there's a, an old um, African proverb that says, uh, if you don't assimilate the young into the village, then they'll burn it down just to be able to warm. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, imagine, imagine I, I've it's, read stories about, how uh, you know these terrorist groups will recruit from western countries and it's like what type of people are they recruiting they're people who don't have much going for them who want to feel special who want to be like uh, recruited who want to be groomed to say like look you are doing something big you're not you know how you live this pathetic life or you're not doing much of anything you could be like a warrior for god and let me convince you why that's the proper interpretation of this holy book and it, it, it's a powerful argument. I mean, it's not hard to recruit, I would imagine, when that's what you're using to recruit. Um, and we see it on a lower scale where, again, uh, if you don't know how to think critically about this stuff, if you're not able to understand how they're using you, um, like Donald Trump isn't killing people or something, but it's the same thing. Like, let me promise you everything. Your life's going to be so much better, but you just have to agree with everything I say and get on board with what I'm selling you. And plenty of people are like, no, he's conning you. He's telling you a lie. Um, and what we saw is that millions of people don't care. They don't know that he's lying to them or they don't care that he's lying to them. Um, and that's a smaller scale version of what's happening with some of these other groups where they can use that same sort of leverage to, to get people on their side too. Well, one of the, the frustrating things though with this last election is, and you know, I... I definitely on the, the liberal end of the spectrum. But um, Hillary Clinton up against Donald Trump, what I found frustrating is she wouldn't even address, you know, the issue of um, religious extremism and terrorist attacks. And, you know, it was, it was very, very, you know, if, if not avoided altogether, yeah. then, you know, there was this kind of, avoidance of calling it Islamic. It was like... Yeah, and I uh, understand why she didn't, and I understand why Obama didn't. I mean, his argument, if I have it right, is that uh, by basically saying there's something wrong with Islam um, and not just the terrorists, you are basically insulting a billion people, most of whom are on your side and you need as allies. That's why he didn't want to say that it was, you know, Islamic uh, extremism or whatever the words are. Um, and I think she, as Secretary of State, felt the same thing, that uh, the problem from her perspective isn't Islam. It's the handful of people who are, or the relatively small percentage of them, who are using the religion in a bad way, and they would be doing more damage. It's not that they didn't think ISIS was rooted in Islam or something. It's that by trying to pretend that Islam is the problem, they would be alienating more people, and ISIS would use that as a recruiting tool, that these people hate Islam come join us and fight the battle. That's the strategic reason they didn't want to do it. Um, but I don't think anyone, uh, many people, I don't think a lot of people understood that. I think they thought they were being cowards. Well, they were being, but, yeah. But because they, they didn't address it, then instead, you know, who do the voters turn to? You know, yeah, it's, it's, no, I know. And, and I think the problem, there's the voters. They're too dumb to understand what's going on. So when Donald Trump says, well, I can say it. Look, Islam is the problem. Let's do a Muslim ban. It's like, dude, you're actually making things worse for, you know, national security. He, um, he, he is, but at the very least, he he would address it and he yeah, wasn't and afraid of, of he's, political correctness. Yeah, I, and, I don't know that political correctness was the issue, but I, I get what you're saying. I have no problem if they, uh, I don't think, I think there could have been a way to easily say, yes, Islam is the problem here, but do it in a nuanced way that doesn't denigrate all these other Muslims too. Yeah, I absolutely wish Hillary Clinton would have done that. I wish Obama would have done that too. Uh, Donald Trump is too stupid to do it the right way. 
um, I think. But like, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just don't get the mindset that says it's, it's she's too afraid to say. <laughs> if you know, I've I've addressed this a, a couple times, and every single time I try to approach it from kind of a nuanced central position where I'm like, okay, don't um, completely just, you know, don't treat the people horribly, you know, right. except that they're human beings. Most of them aren't violent people. Most of them just want right. to live in peace and to have, you know, an, an economic opportunity. And most of them aren't even following their Quran to the letter. Yeah. But we have to also be able to look at you know, the ideology of Islam and to not just throw out words like Islamophobia and bigot and racist the second yeah. someone tries to question an ideology. No, you're absolutely and right. Again, and that, even, believe me, I'm with you. Just, just I, by taking that kind of, you know, middle ground nuanced position, I get attacked from both sides where some people <laughs> are like, no, it's all Muslims, you know, don't right. let any of them into the country. And then you have people, you know, on the other side who are like, you know, you're an Islamophobic, right. you know, right-wing, crazy. <laughs> and right. There's no... You can't even take a central position. I, it's so polarized. It is polarized. And believe me, I have plenty of criticism of the quote unquote regressive left and all that stuff, too. I do think I mean, I think Trump does it totally wrong. Um, but of all the reasons to not vote for Hillary Clinton, to this idea that she's too weak on that issue or Obama was too weak on that issue, I just don't buy. Um, I'm sure there's legitimate criticism for things they could have done better. But. I'm I have this feeling that they knew what they were doing if they weren't saying, you know, radical Islamic terrorism. It's not because they were afraid of doing it or that they didn't think Islam would, had anything to do with the problem. They just felt, you know what, that is not a helpful term in terms of achieving the goals we want to achieve. You don't have to agree with that, but that's I think where they're coming from on this. Um, and this idea that they were not saying it because they were cowardly or afraid of offending people. Uh, I just don't buy. I don't know. I think most people are just, oh, Donald Trump is criticizing them. We like it. We'll go ahead and vote for him, which is stupid. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't I don't buy that argument that that's that was the biggest problem with Hillary Clinton. But uh, oh, I'm not I'm not saying that it's it's the biggest. Problem, oh, not the biggest I'm or saying, a problem. Um, I, I just don't think that know, that's I had plenty hard. of other issues with her. But my I think that the election was so close. Yeah. Maybe, do you think it would have that, helped if she had said that? That could have tipped the scales. That, I think that that was definitely one of the issues that huh. you know the, the the whole PC. You know, we've got to tiptoe around these you know, topics and issues. And and the I fact heard that, that argument Trump was. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, I I heard that argument that you know the the left is too PC and that's why people didn't vote for that. And I I have yet to see evidence that that's the reason. I mean. When the vote's so close in a few states, like you could pin it on anything, um, but it seems ridiculous to to me to for people to think that the entire election was spun because people were too afraid of uh, dealing with I don't know liberals who annoyed them. <laughs> like really, that's the reason you want to burn the country up because oh she's but it, it's 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 more than that though because. Um... You know, and we've seen this um, even on college campuses where you have people like Milo who are right. gaining massive snowball support. Right. But they're also highly controversial and polarizing and stuff. And he'll come up, he, he's a contrarian. His whole job is to stir up controversy and to right. talk about controversial issues because he knows that that's what gets, you know, noticed right. in the press. But. You know, when, when he goes to a college campus like UC Berkeley and those kinds of riots are the response and he's right. like, you know, has to be escorted out. Oh, yeah, that's police, ridiculous. Police and granted, that's <laughs> like a small group of idiots who are doing that sort of thing. Uh, but you're right. The fact that people get yeah. that worked up. I mean, believe me, this is not a new issue. It was happening uh, 10, 15 years ago when I was in college as well, where, oh, look, it's a controversial speaker. We should protest and not let them speak. Uh, like, no, that's always been ridiculous. And yes, it's liberals usually who are the ones protesting. Um, I don't know. I find I, I find I have a hard time getting worked up over not the UC Berkeley thing. I mean, anyone who uses violence or anything like that, that's absurd. Don't do that. Um, I find it hard to get worked up about people who are saying uh, it's not just about Milo or anyone else being a contrarian or saying things you don't like. It's that 
he legitimately just uh, trashes people who are like transgender. Uh, he's like calling them out specifically, harassing them. Um, he's totally racist Whoa. in the way he deals with certain things. Um, I mean, the fact that they're bringing... I'm, I'm not... I'm not I know you're to, not defending defend any of that. No. He says, uh, I'm just purely from the, the standpoint of free speech. Yeah, no, no, no. You know, I, he, I'm with you there. And I'm saying be, like... He could be up there saying the most hideous, horrible thing. And, and I think you're giving him a bigger platform by... You know, showing up in uh, riot form. Yes. No. 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 I'm totally just... with you. I'm told. I think we're on the same page on this. Um, you should absolutely. When it's, let me give you a different example. Someone like uh, Christina Hoff Summers, the the feminist uh, who doesn't like what a lot of feminists are doing. Um, her views totally unpopular among feminists. But as far as speaking goes, she basically, as far as I've seen, here's her, what she thinks. Here's what she's using to back it up. Um, and if you disagree with it, then you disagree with it. Let's have a debate about that. Um, when people protest that and like whatever, blow air horns or don't let her talk, totally dumb. That is ridiculous. Um, now, to think that that represents like all liberals or that everyone's in support of that, no, it's usually just a handful of people at any school who are really dumb when it comes to strategy on this stuff. Because you're right, it draws way too much attention to the very thing like they oppose. They would be so much smarter by saying, hey, you know this unpopular speaker, whether it's Milo or anyone else who's talking here? We should go there and ask questions, whatever, during the Q&A. And then, by the way, after he's done, we're holding our own event where we're rebutting all the stupid shit he says, and we hope you come to that too, would be way smarter and would draw far better attention if they did that. But most of them don't do that, which boggles my mind. But again, I'm not on college, uh, in college anymore. I'm not on a campus. So it's like one of those things where, oh, it's someone else's problem. I don't have to deal with this anymore. <laughs> um, so whatever. Uh, it's it, the way they strategically go about trying to combat this stuff. It just seems stupid. And I'm with you. I just don't know why that would be like a political issue for people like you think if not you <laughs> do do people think if oh if hillary clinton gets elected then free speech is dead or milo won't get to talk or we're only going to see more of that stuff like no it's that has nothing to do with anything mm, yes and no because at the same time it's not just you know milo going into college campuses you have you know professors who are being um who say some things and then they get fired or something? Yeah, or, or even who, you know, right now, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jordan Peterson up in Canada. Which, who, who is that one? He's, he's a professor who has been, he's been talking about, um, basically, he, he was like, I don't know, I don't remember all the details, but mm -hmm. he, he didn't want to use the, the transgender proteins. Or, Pronouns? Uh-huh. Um, for this level. Yeah. Um, and he's basically like, there's way too many of these and like whether or not I use them or not, it's, you know, just my choice free speech. Yeah. And um, as a result, he's having charges pressed against him in Canada <laughs> for that. And, yeah. you know, th then there, there's other professors. You know, that's who, one of those um, things where I kind of, I get where he's coming from at the same, because this is not an issue I know very well because I'm not LGBT. And all I can say is, look, I've talked to a lot of transgender people who will tell you this is a really important issue for them that they want to be called by a certain pronoun. And it's like, oh, like when you hear their arguments for it and why they want it that way, it's like, oh, I, I mean, this isn't coming out of nowhere. You actually have legit reasons. And I'm ignorant of it because well, this and, isn't and my thing. And you know what? That professor, I, I, too, I that professor, I, I think that. that professor is ignorant of it, too. And again, do I think he should be fired for having a opinion that i disagree with or something no do i think he's going out of his way to intentionally like harass transgender people no um yes people can go way too far with certain things like this um i just don't i mean this is a problem with a handful of liberals it there's, doesn't but i mean there there's professors right now who are if when they, they speak up about islam then you know they risk losing their jobs there's professors uh, even uh, peter bogosian Back in, in 2015, he had an interview with uh, Dave Rubin, and he was talking about how frustrating it was, how you know, he works full-time in academia. And he, you know who that is, right? He wrote, you yes. know, for creating movies. Um, and, you know, and, and here's someone who is completely on the left, mm -hmm. an atheist, 
who is frustrated with you know the the level of censorship or self-censorship that you have to impose yeah. on yourself in order to appease people so you don't get complaints so you don't get you know called into the, the office and, and potentially lose your job if you're not tenured and he's not right right i mean i get i get and, that and i think where it, it wouldn't be such a big deal except that um universities are they're supposed to be a place for open discourse and for free speech and historically have been Right. Um, so, I mean, I guess one thing I would want to say back is to the people who want these people fired or something or who are pushing that battle, what do you think their response is to, to what you're saying? Do you think they're, they're thinking, yes, I want that guy fired because he's just not using the pronoun I want him to use or because uh, Boghossian's critical of Islam and I don't want anyone to be critical of religion? Um, because I don't think that's the response they would give. Um, and this is where the dialogue kind of ends, usually, when I see these debates online or when I listen to people talk about this. Um, I guess every time I hear one of these debates, I want to say, tell me what the other side's position is on this. And if you mischaracterize it, I don't care what you have to say because you don't even know what you're complaining about. I don't think they would say that. I think what transgender people would say with the pronoun guy is... This is going far beyond just call me whatever I want you to call me. It's that you're imposing some level of harassment onto transgender students. And it's hard for other people to understand why that's harassment. But I don't know. Let let them explain it. For the uh, things like, oh, you're critical of Islam. Here's why, to me, that goes too far. Um, whatever. Whatever the reason is. I'm not defending it because I think a lot of these people go too far myself. Um, but I'm saying, like, this is the side I never really hear. I will see a lot of YouTubers, for example, totally critical of feminism or a certain brand of feminism or something. And the thing I just want to like scream back at them is I'm like, I get why some of these people are annoying. But what I really want to hear is when you say, look, these feminists think this way. But if you ask those feminists, do you think this way? The answer is no. <laughs> like, why? If you can't even tell me what their issue is with certain things or why... Yeah, people are going to be annoying about everything. I'm not worried about that. But if you can't characterize your opponent's position correctly, which I don't think most of these critics can, I don't take what they have to say very seriously. Um, and I kind of want every debate or any criticism of... <laughs> of that sort of well, thing. I wanted to begin with here's my here's what they believe and here's why they're wrong about it cuz I don't think yeah. they'll ever get that first part right. At least not and, with a lot of the YouTubers I've seen. Feminism is um it's it's one of those things where I for a long time I told myself that I would um avoid it on my channel because there's <laughs> so much vitriol surrounding right. it. But it's it's almost like you can't get away from it in the, the atheist movement because it's it's just Everywhere, and it's become something that is, it's divided the movement. Um, you know, you have certain... What, um, I'm, let me go back for a second. What do you think has divided the movement in regards to feminism? What, what is it that's divisive? Well, so... Like, what are the two sides or the multiple sides? So, oh, what was it, like four or five years ago, there was somewhat of a, at least... I wasn't a, an activist at the yeah. time. In fact, I was I was still emerging out of my faith. But yeah. um, reading back on it, it, it seems like there was a lot more unity within the atheist movement. It was kind of the golden age of YouTube atheism. You had you know all these these videos, a series, playlists by like Thunderfoot and R. And right. R and as as was, someone a lot of unity there. as someone who was around in that time, I would say uh, no, there wasn't necessarily unity. But everyone was, I mean, you were going to find something. We were small. It was cordial. It was cordial Somewhat. because there weren't that many people. So there wasn't that much to argue about. Um, yeah. I, I really don't think feminism is the thing that just like, oh, if feminism was well, around. You know what I mean? And, but um, then, then, there was, then there was Elevator Gate. Right, right. No, let me go back to that because I don't yeah. want to rehash all of Elevator Gate thing. I have, yeah. as someone who, is, who was around when that happened, who knew everyone kind of involved and has seen so many people talk about it ever since. Everyone who talks about it ever since seems to get every detail wrong about that. And here's the other thing. This goes back to the question I had, which is, I don't even know what, if there is a rift 
on this matter, I don't know what the rift is over because it seems like it's over stupid details or personalities or what one person he said, she said sort of thing, which that that always happens with everything. Like, good luck finding a movement of any sort that doesn't have that sort of conflict. Um, But on a broader scale, let's let's step back for a minute. If we're arguing over feminism or something, what are we arguing about? Because I think for the most part, it's just some people just don't like other people. I don't know that we're on different sides necessarily of all these issues because I don't know a lot of atheists that are notable on YouTube or what have you who would say they're against, you know, uh, equal pay for equal work or maternity leave, paternity leave, things like that. Well, the, the biggest issues, and, and this comes more from uh, YouTubers like um, Sargon of Akkad and uh, uh, what's his name, Armored Skeptic, and um, there, there's quite a few who have kind of taken the more anti-feminist, uh, Thunderfoot is one of them, has yeah. taken the more anti-feminist approach. And I think one of the big arguments is it's kind of coupled with the whole Gamergate um, thing that, that happened a while back. And Which, again, sounds like, to me, there's, there's sounds a like a, it's a dumb argument over a he said, she said, what are we there, even there, arguing about well, anymore? There, there's a, <laughs> a certain percentage of feminists who definitely take things to the extreme. Yeah, I mean, but you're going to find I that. Think that, that. Do I think that that's the majority of, of feminists? Or, or even like like feminism itself, a lot of people who would be egalitarian or second-wave feminists don't right, self-identify as feminists anymore because it's kind of taken on a negative um, connotation. Right. No, I, and, my argument to you is I, I know what you're talking about. I don't think you're wrong that some people take these things too far. Some people are super annoying in the way they talk about anything. But you're going to find that in any topic. I mean, I am super liberal. There are liberals who are so annoying about everything. And yes, that is going to rub a bunch of people the wrong way. Um, This is not unique to, to atheism. This is not unique to feminism or anything like that. It happens within every single movement of any sort. I just so I just don't think that uh, if, if it wasn't feminism, it would have been something else. Um, that just happened to be like the thing that burst at the seam at this particular time. Um, but again, I I find it useful anyway to get away from that word, which I think is polarizing. Yeah. Um, to a lot of people and talk more about specifics here and there like what is it and I don't know that there's much of a difference if you break down to to specific issues yeah. you know do I uh, do most atheists think uh, women should have a right to have an abortion something like that I think overwhelmingly everyone would say yeah they should have that right there's a very small percentage of pro-life atheists who want to like rid abortion get rid of it or something like that but, if you break even, it down topic by topic issues like that I think that you know that the, there should be with any issue, no matter how yeah. controversial it is, we should be able to have an open discussion based off of facts and Absolutely. look at the science and Absolutely. look at the data, rather than you know suddenly having these ad hominem attacks on each other just because we disagree. Right? No, I'm because totally I, with you. you. Know, I know totally with you. And perfectly respectable atheists. Christopher Hitchens was one of them who yeah. was um, pro-life. Yes, uh, and Nat Hentoff, who just died not too long ago, was also really, really pro-life. And again, yes, it's easy for me to say, yes, let's have this debate and uh, let's go where the facts are because I think my side is right with all this stuff, right? We all think that way. Um, I think it gets a little frustrating for some people, just trying to see this from the other perspective, which is to say, why are we debating what I should do with my body? That seems like one, like, and you could do this for uh, racism issues too, Like, should slavery be illegal? Like, why are we debating that? Of course it should be illegal. Who are you? Yes, you have the free speech to say otherwise, but, like, why are we debating this? And I think the frustration from the other side is the things that what you're saying, like, we should be able to have a debate about this. Sometimes it's one of those things, like, why? Why should we have a debate? Why are we just saying it's totally fine for this person to have this opinion that is horrific and having a student group pay for their expenses to come out to school and spread this even though they have a right to do it um and to get back to your point like what's the proper response then 
I think the proper response is, you know, you respond to free speech with more free speech and give them a serious counter perspective. Don't shut them down because that only feeds their martyrdom. Like, no, hold a separate event. Give them more facts that rebuts what they say. That is a smarter way to handle it. But to go back to the issue you were bringing up, like, I don't think the the rift in atheism happened or anything because of you know, a particular person or two. I mean, people are going to fight about everything. And we're a movement that got bigger really quickly. That happens. If you go to the LGBT movement, you could point to, like, rifts in that movement, too. Um, And within feminism, I'm sure you could point to rifts in there where that, like, oh, look, we were all united, and then something happened, and then we started splitting up. Like, every single movement experiences that sort of thing. Um, This is not unique to us. What I would hope is that we could learn from all these other people who have had to go through the same thing, these growing pains of any movement, and figure out how to do it. For me, I don't, this is kind of what you said earlier, this isn't a topic I care so much about to get into the he said, she said. Um, I'm sure I felt differently when that elevator gate stuff was happening. I remember talking about that stuff. And now I totally wouldn't talk about it because it's just an irrelevant thing for me. But I will... Push feminist issues or certain uh, things within it, free speech, um, women's rights, things. I will totally advocate for that, but I'll do it in my own way. And I'm not like, I'm not getting into a stupid argument with Thunderfoot over stuff. Well, and the the frustrating thing is it's it's almost like if you engage with certain people Mm -hmm. on one side or the other, you're automatically classified in that camp. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That's totally true. um, both uh, Richard Carrier and PZ Myers, who are kind of, I think right now, uh, Richard Carrier is suing. Yes, he is. Yeah. And both of them, uh, at separate points, said that they would come on, on Holy Kool Aid. Uh huh. And that, that they would, um, you know, peer review some of my videos, one on like the history of Jesus and one on evolution. Yeah. And they're, they're both incredibly well educated in those areas. And have done their research, and I think it'd be phenomenal to, to you know, have some of their, their expertise you know, to, to, to kind of promote that. Yeah. But just because there's so much drama, right? And, you know, I've, I've avoided it because I don't want to, to I just, I don't know, there, there's something about... You're going to get backlash either way if you bring them on or anything like that. And again, but all it's of... not just them, you know? I mean, oh, there's, there's a... people who... <laughs> You know, there, there are some really good opinions, you know, by Armored Skeptic or yeah. some, someone like that, that, you know, I, I'd love to, to sit down and talk with them about, but I'm going to get some shit for, you know, um, for engaging with them. And, and then if I engage with someone um, like Rebecca Watson, who's, yeah. you know, on, on the other side, like, I'm going to get shit if I talk to her about skepticism. So, I, I mean, but to I, me, you could do this a couple ways. One is to say... Um, you want to bring on all these people that you respect for whatever different reasons and you want to have a conversation with them, but you're going to do it on your terms and you're going to challenge them and stuff. And I think you would get less backlash that way. Um, there, But again, the people you say are going to be upset about that stuff, screw them. If they're upset because they can't handle like, oh, you're talking to Rebecca and they get pissed off about it, like... Those people are the problem. It's not Rebecca that's the problem because you're talking to her and she agreed to it. It's these people who can't deal with her. Like, screw well, them. And, and here's the thing. It. Just because I have someone on my channel doesn't yeah. mean that I agree with everything. That yeah, they I know. You're retweeting. It doesn't mean it's an endorsement. <laughs> I like. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You're bringing them on because you want to engage them in some conversation about these things that they're super passionate about doesn't mean you agree with them maybe you want to argue with them i do the same thing on uh my podcast too where i want to i've invited anyway people i totally disagree with and i tell them up front you know i disagree with you on this and i'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk to me about it but here's the difference i don't want to get in a yelling match with them i don't want to fight them and i think this is where you're coming from too i want to have a real discussion about these issues where we disagree because I think I can do it on my terms and we can make this interesting so that it won't alienate people who might just say, oh, you're talking to that person. Screw it. I'm not listening. I'm going home. Or they're going to leave a nasty comment online or whatever. I'm not doing it for those people. They can't be reached. They're 
pathetic. They're yeah. <laughs> like, forget them. I'm not doing this for them. I'm doing this for the people who I think are interested in this conversation. And I think if you can, and you know what? Um, I think Dave Rubin does that a lot of times too. I don't agree with a lot of the stuff he says, but he brings people on and he has an interesting conversation with these people. And that's good. Um, I do it very differently though for like my own YouTube videos because I don't engage directly with a lot of the people you just mentioned who do YouTube because you're right. Not only is it going to start a shit storm, like I don't want to do it on their terms or like, like let me just say what I want to say and leave it at that. Um, I kind of, I, I don't want to talk about their buzzwords, but for example, I put out at least a video or two saying you should vote for Hillary Clinton. You're like crazy if you care about atheism and church state separation and don't vote for her. That's absurd. But I know that if I say that, there will be people who are going to be like, oh, you're a sheeple, you're whatever, you know what the, they're going to say about it. So the, the challenge then is, okay, I still believe this stuff. How can I get it across in a way that's not as polarizing, even though I do share that same message? And to go, uh, I would love to see you interview some of the people you just mentioned, um, including the ones you disagree with. Because I think if you can have that conversation and do it civilly and and say, look, this is something we disagree about. Let's see if we can hash this out somehow. That's a fascinating conversation to listen to. I don't see that conversation a lot. Certainly not on YouTube. Um, a little more I hear it on podcasts, but not that much. But that's the sort of thing like I would totally be interested in that conversation. I don't care if you're talking to like crazy religious right extremists. If you could do it and have a conversation with them. I would find that interesting. Are you going to get backlash for it? Hell yes. But you're getting backlash from people who can't deal with it. And isn't that the problem you want to avoid by like, you know, you invite a Milo to a school and these people like go crazy over it. And it's like, well, those are the ones who are the, you know, extremists on that side. Forget them. Most people aren't like them. They're just the loudest. Whoa. Do it for all those other people who want to listen. And, you know, so like, uh, for example, Bill Maher, had Milo on his show a few weeks ago. Um, and one guy who was supposed to be a guest said, screw it. Like, if you're going to invite that guy on and give him a platform, I don't even want to be on your show that week. And I thought Bill Maher's response to that was perfect, which is to say, if you think Milo is wrong about all this stuff, you should come on my show and tell us why and fight fight his stupidity with something smart. That would have been the, the moment that you don't show up is the moment that you lose the argument. Yeah, and the moment you shut that person down is the moment you lose that argument too. And so I'm, I mean, I'm totally with you on that. Um, it's it's a little bit easier for me too because I am fully nomadic, and yeah. so I don't have an address that they can show up and, and you know, <laughs> harass me at. Right, right, um, and it's easier to like just I don't know. I ignore a lot of the nasty the worst, comments. The worst I get is mean youtube comments and oh no yeah right and you know what it's easy for me to ignore it because they they don't come that often um yeah. and if they come they're they're usually like something anonymous like a youtube comment or something on twitter well, and, and most most of my subscribers are fairly supportive of yeah. this. Um, and, I, I think it's it's a little bit easier for for you and people like seth andrews to um bring on controversial people because you know, you already have kind of a, a history. Maybe. And, um, you know, people kind of know what you're about. They know what you uh, what you stand for. Whereas, like, my channel is still fairly new. You know, it, it, I haven't been around for years and years. I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying, though. I would say if you started bringing people on and having the sorts of conversations that you want to have with them, that's how you get known for, no, look, look, I'm the guy who's willing to talk to people I disagree with and people who are controversial, but we do it in a way that doesn't fall into these traps that, you know, this he said, she said, this, let me just quote this person out of context and then make fun of them. You know, if you put out there, this is not what I do. I want to have a real conversation. I think you can, you can get away with it and become known as, oh, you're the guy who's the reasonable one to talk to. Um, you just have to start doing it, you know? So... Everyone who has a platform now didn't have one at the beginning, but then, you know, you just start doing it and hopefully, and again, like I'm saying, you can go back through my archives of blogging because I've been doing it long enough. You will, I will find things on there where I'm like, why the hell did I write that? I don't feel that way anymore. I've learned since 
whatever. I'm sure there are things I posted like last month where I'm like, that was stupid. I shouldn't have said that. And hopefully you you learn from that along the way. Um, but again, you, and re- remember, and I know you know this too, most of the people who agree with you and support you and like the work you do are never going to comment. They will never reach out to you. and But they're there. But the, the whatever, the few percent of people who don't like it and disagree with you, like they're going to let their voices be known like crazy. You just got to remember like, oh, just because I'm getting all this hate mail or these nasty comments, that doesn't represent most of the people listening to this. So let me just well, keep I'm, doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I've, I've always found it crazy that people would um, get angry over hearing a different opinion. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, if, if I hear something and I know that it's being spread, you know, like there was a video just came out by uh, Dennis Prager. Yeah. And I, I'm actually in the, I will have released this last week by the time mm-hmm. people see this interview, but I'm, I'm working on a, uh, a response video to it that's basically um, an animated version of Christopher Hitchens responding from the grave. <laughs> but this is the response because, to uh, Prager saying like atheists have no morals because yeah, we don't know yeah. any better. Yeah. Because when he was alive, uh, Hitchens made a habit of um, uh, going after Dennis Prager and rebutting and refuting all the the nonsense that he would spout. And so I kind of I figured that he should do the honors. Yeah, no, I love that idea. Um, And that'll be fun. But but you know what? That's awesome, too, because it's he made a stupid video that makes no sense at all. And you're going to respond to it in your own way. And I hope that that gets attention, too. But that I mean. I would hope no one's saying, oh, Prager said this stupid thing. He needs to be shut down. We <laughs> we need to boycott his channel somehow. I haven't heard that argument made, which is which is well, good. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the thing. If I see something that I disagree with, um, I don't think, you know, even if it's someone who has a terrible, horrible viewpoint, because I know that, you know, I used to be very religious, and then I, I learned a bunch of new stuff, and I was like, oh, I was wrong. Like, I change my perspective. When I hear a viewpoint that I disagree with, I'm still going to listen to it and, and try to figure out why do they believe this? You know, Is there any merit to their position? Because if it's true, I want to go where the truth leads. And maybe I can come away better off for having learned from it. And, you know what? and even if it's not true, then at the very least, I learn how to combat poisonous opinions by studying and learning how they operate and how they think. Right. To paraphrase uh, Matt Dillahunty, I want to know more true things in the future than I do now. Star Trek or Star Wars? Neither. Never watched either of them. Neither. I know. So Lord of, Lord of the Rings. Uh, haven't seen that either. <laughs> I'm so horrible at this. Favorite movie or show? Uh, Survivor is amazing. Screw all of you who are making fun of me. Uh, favorite <laughs> movie? Shawshank Redemption is awesome. Wait, you just had a guy from Survivor on. I like, did. On it was the show. greatest moment of my life. Nice. You guys are going to have to go check that out. I'll, I'll put a link in the description. <laughs> um, ice cream cone or ice cream bar? Cone. What's the square root of 5,643,298? 372. I have no idea if that's right. <laughs> it would I, I just be cool if it was. Math teacher, so, uh, <laughs> do you still read Saturday morning breakfast cereal? I, do I still read it? Yes. I love Zach. He is fantastic. Uh, he's so good at what he does. It makes me mad. <laughs> he's so good at everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, that comic is great. So is XKCD, as always. Yeah, I love XKCD. <laughs> and uh, last question. Where can people go to find your stuff? Sure. Um, all The blogging is the main thing I do, and that's at FriendlyAtheist.com. That's the easiest way to get there. Um if you the podcast is called the Friendly Atheist Podcast because I don't know how to name things anymore, um, and on YouTube you can find me at Atheist Voice. Uh, so hopefully you can and uh, everything else is linked through there. You'll find other links when you get there. Yeah, oh, well, you've written a couple different books that are Audible, Amazon. Yeah, places. there's also books, right? Uh, just uh, go to FriendlyAtheist.com. There's links to the books. It's all good. Do you, do you ever sleep? No. <laughs> That's a problem. Uh, and a baby <laughs> baby doesn't help. <laughs> I'm usually up really late at night, and then I, I get to sleep in a little bit in the morning, but 
Yeah, no, I, I do most of my work really late at night. All right. Well, then I, I should let you go so that you can, uh, <laughs> I guess it's not too late there. It just, I don't know if people can tell, but the sun just came up here. I see that. A bit of a time with us, <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me, Thomas. I really appreciate it. And good luck with everything you're doing. And I can't wait to see what your channel becomes. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I'll, we'll definitely need to keep in touch and maybe we'll run into each other at a conference somewhere. In the that future. would be a blast. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. It's been awesome, guys. This is him and Meta. Make sure the, the friendly atheist. Make sure that you check out his stuff. I'll have all the links in the description. Um, thanks for joining me and have a fantastic evening.